Hello there everyone, I'm UXW Bill, and today for your viewing pleasure I present yet another UXW Bill computer video. Yeah, that's right, I went out and found some computers and brought them home with me, and while I'd have to admit I don't really feel like playing around with them and making a video at the same time, I have in all honesty had a number of people bugging me to make another computer video. So here it is, I do want to take a moment and apologize for... Not only the dog barking as random people go by on bicycles, but also the glare from the sun that's reflecting into the camcorder's lens. I would reach up and grab the pull chain that turns the sun off, but it's a little bit taller than I am, so I don't think I can do that. So we'll just have to make do. We'll see what we've got here. First thing we have, and I know it's going to surprise a lot of you who know that I really like Dell computers when I describe this as being worthless junk, but... In this day and age, that's pretty much what anything with a Pentium 4 in it is. This is a Dell Dimension 4400. I wouldn't have even bothered bringing this home, but it has two parallel ATA hard drives in it. It's been sitting out in the weather for a long time. I have a distinct feeling that paying any amount of money for this was too much, and that I'll probably regret it, but if the hard drives inside are good, That'll come in handy for something that takes a parallel ATA hard drive. And then there's this, which probably isn't worth a whole lot more money, but at least this is a Core 2 Duo. Conroe era, if I'm not mistaken. And those are generally still pretty worthwhile machines, especially the later Wolfdale and similar family variants. This is in a Hewlett Packard RP5700 Business Desktop PC. I think this is a small form factor-ish version of the HP Compaq DC5700. What can I say? I'm not really the world's biggest fan of Hewlett-Packard anything, but the form factor kind of appealed to me, as did the front panel design. And as we'll see in a moment, there are definitely some worthwhile aspects to this thing's design. Check out the warranty information on this. Five years across the board. I don't know why somebody would have popped for that kind of a warranty on this thing, because in five years' time, a can of yams is going to be worth more than this computer is. Also notice there's no certificate of authenticity for any version of Windows. So maybe somebody ordered this without an operating system. It's really hard to tell. But one thing I can tell you is that this thing is playing the real computer game in spades. Check out how many serial ports this thing has. There's two. And there's two more installed in an expansion slot. This thing's got more serial ports than Carter's got little pills. It'll be interesting to see how many members of the viewing audience are old enough to get that reference. <laughs> or who have heard it somewhere along the way. I have no idea why this thing has four serial ports in it. Historically, the PC architecture did allow you to have that many. Although with historical PC operating systems such as MS-DOS and even Windows 3.1, which really isn't considered to be an operating system by a lot of people, but the, the term is hotly debated as to its relevance to that version of Windows. But on those platforms, although you could have four serial ports, and they all had, if I'm remembering this correctly, they all had different I.O. ranges, but the interrupt requests overlapped. You had two ports on IRQ3 and two ports on IRQ4. So in an, in an operating system environment that didn't support interrupt sharing like OS2 or even Windows NT, both did support IRQ sharing. You could only use two of your serial ports at once, unless of course you got something like a grandiosely expensive serial port uh, multi-port breakout, like IBM's old Arctic boards or something along those lines. I don't know what someone could have been doing with this, but let's go ahead and pop the cover on it and the Dell. Look at this. I was standing here making a video and I was being spied on by some guy who would be far better advised to oil his car to get all the squeaks out of it. <laughs> you want me to call the police or should I call them myself? Uh, you just kind of said the same thing there twice, Chief. Look at that. It's the long arm of the law. <laughs> Go oil your car. It squeaks. It's not doing it right now, though. Of course it wouldn't, because I've got it on video. Well, all right, here's the Dell popped open. And you know, for a guy who was telling me just moments ago he's going to call the police, the key keeper has never done so, even when he probably should have, when I openly admitted to stealing the water pan out of his dehumidifier. 
I guess he doesn't actually watch my videos. Not that I'd blame him. I mean, no one should watch this crap. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look and see what kind of hard drives we got here in this poor old Dell. Boy, that power cable stretched tight. I'll take a little bit of strain off of that so maybe I can get it out of the connector. We'll pop this out of here. Let's see what this is. This actually looks like an old uh, Mac Store drive or Quantum drive. Yeah, Quantum, uh, Quantum Fireball. Mac Store actually adopted that line when they bought Quantum's hard drive business from them. They did not actually buy Quantum. Quantum still exists today as an independent company that specializes in data backup solutions. For a while they were doing stuff with tape. But Mac Store ended up buying these out, and as unreliable as these old uh, Fireball drives came to be in their later years, doesn't that just seem fitting? I wonder if that's the original issue hard drive. The second one, let's say this looks like Western Digital, just pulling it out. Yep, it's a Western Digital drive. What size is it? 80 gigabytes. Nice quality drive. Always had good service from these. Somebody upgraded that in 28 April of 2004, or very close to, at least that's when the drive was made. It probably didn't sit around in the retail channel for any more than a year or so. And then of course, as far as other hardware goes, we have an awful lot of expansion cards. But very little in the way of installed dynamic memory, and I can hardly wait for some clever clogs to call me on this in the comments area, saying, you moron, I can clearly see that that's a 256 megabyte module, and there you are hemming and hawing about something that's visible in plain sight. You know, it does take a fair amount of overhead to run this camera. Boy, I'm just really, I'm just really full of P and V today, aren't I? But yeah, that's a 256 megabyte module. I looked at that beforehand. Let's see, 266 megahertz. So not the most high performance thing in the world, and unfortunately the way Dell designed these things, it's a complete pain in the rear to put a memory module back in here if there's a video card fitted. And of course a system like this would have to have a video card of some kind because there's no built-in video logic on the motherboard. Let's see what else we get. There's a Sound Blaster Live of some description. There's a model number if anybody want to, wants to look me up, look that up and give me the 411 on it. Again, it'll be interesting to see how many people get that. An old Connexent modem and an aftermarket, almost certainly aftermarket, Netgear PCI fast Ethernet board with a whole bunch of fairly awesome blinking lights on it that are pretty well covered up with dust at this point. And there, of course, is a look at the ports on the motherboard. This, of course, does qualify as a real computer because you have the PS2 ports, have the parallel port, serial port, and yes, there is a floppy drive. So that's the Dell. Let's take a look at the HP, see what's going on in here. This also qualifies as a real computer, though upon looking around, Although there are a great deal of legacy ports within this system's design, as we previously saw, it does not appear to be a floppy drive connector anywhere. Not that I can say I'm hugely surprised. I have a desktop version, the DC5700 as previously noted, and I don't believe it has a floppy drive connector anywhere either. Nor is there a parallel ATA channel, but that's essentially obsolete. I have birds living in part of the Roach Palace right now, and you can probably hear them in the background. It's my own real-life Angry Birds game <laughs> from the sound of things. Even they won't be quiet when I'm trying to make a video. Here we have another Western Digital hard drive, 80 gigabytes in size. Serial ATA, of course. Serial ATA optical drive. What are this drive's capabilities? DVD multiplayer and compact disc. So I'm guessing not a disc burner in any capacity, just a simple reader, which is perfectly fine with me. Of course, we have a big old fan there in the front. A fair bit of carpet sprinkled throughout this system. Nice looking heatsink. Doesn't have a copper core in it, but it's still impressive looking nevertheless. And then there's a little business audio speaker in here, which is certainly nothing like as nice as the ones in the old compact desk pro systems of yore. Although it may not sound too bad. 
It says it's got a 4 ohm impedance and a 1.5 watt nominal power handling capability, probably with a rather healthy following wind. There's the clock battery on the motherboard. And while it has a PCI Express X16 slot, it says add two card only, and that means unfortunately that there is no meaningful option by which a high performance or even medium performance video card could be added to this system. Because all in the world this slot allows you to do, just like its bigger brother, the DC5700, is to add a card that provides for the connection of a second monitor. So that's kind of unfortunate. Also got a free power cable with this. There was one with this too, but I left it behind because do you know anybody that works on computers and doesn't have a million, billion, trillion power cables that are slowly forming a tangled web that eventually turns into a black hole? I certainly have about that many. I don't know if I've got a monitor out here that I could plug those computers into and power them up or even enough input devices to give them a proper test. But let me see what I can dig up here, and we'll just see what either one of these systems do. If they work, or if they both proceed straight to the scene of the crash, or even the fire. Maybe both. All right, everybody, we're back, thanks to the magic of video editing. And the Dell's the one I'm going to try first, and already I can tell you I have a great feeling about this. Because look at how loose that is. It's actually the screws that are holding that in that are loose. Now they're not so loose that the things at risk of falling out of there and short circuiting. But you know, I'm overdue for having a power supply go pop or even to drop a circuit breaker. So let's just see what happens here. Because I'm a huge chicken, we're going to stand over here and we'll turn it on. Okay, well it's running with no fireworks so far. And yes, because people never read video descriptions, yes, I have had computers blow up when I've plugged them in, or very shortly thereafter. But now that it seems like this thing actually might be worth fooling around with, and isn't likely to turn my uh, input devices into Rice Krispies, making them go snap, crackle, and pop, I'll go ahead and get everything hooked up here. And I expect that since this thing turned itself on when I applied power, that the CMOS battery is probably long since dead. It's my understanding that both of these computers came out of a storage unit that someone had defaulted on. But that's really the extent of my knowledge. And I know, I know, I deserve some serious demerit points for what I'm doing here after talking up those PS2 ports and then hooking up weenie modern USB based input devices. I should probably lose my master computer technician certificate for that or something. We'll go ahead and turn everything back on here. See what our monitor's doing. It didn't stay on this time. In fact, it didn't turn on at all. I feel something vibrating inside there, but it's not doing anything else. Well, I'll play around with it and see if I can get it to turn on again. Okay, well it is running, the fans are turning, it does have power, but evidently something is sufficiently wrong that there isn't even any sign of life from the system BIOS through the diagnostic LEDs. So I might play around with that one a little bit later, but in the meantime, let's turn our attention to the worthwhile one see if this thing does anything useful or interesting. All right, here we go with the Hewlett Packard all cabled up and ready to go. All right, at least it didn't blow up. Let's try turning it on and see what it does. Oh, it's not happy. I don't know if that's an error code or just generic beeping. I think it's actually some form of an error code. And I'll tell you what, we'll kind of punt and take a guess on this one. My best guess here is possibly, and I'm just guessing, that's all. Because I don't have all the error codes for every computer ever manufactured in my head. Just the ones that I see often, which are usually the Dells. Just going to take a guess here. I'm thinking illegal memory configuration. It looks like someone did try to upgrade the RAM in this computer at some point. 
You can see there's a fairly low profile Kingston module installed in there between the two probably factory issue Hynix modules. So we'll flip this up and we'll get that out of there and we'll just see if we can persuade the thing to boot. It might need a little more of an exploratory than that to convince it I mean business. I wonder how big a deal it'll be if I don't plug in power to that serial port card because I don't want to flex that connection right off the mother, right off the daughter board, the expansion card. So we won't worry about that for right now. Let's just try that again. See if it's any more receptive to starting up. Well, it would be if I'd plug the power cable into it. They do tend to work better that way. So we'll go again now. Nope, still unhappy. All right, well, let me do some exploratory surgery and poke around for a bit and see if I can convince it to come back to life. All right, so that was it. It was unhappy about one of the memory modules. Interestingly, the module it's complaining about, about actually seems to be one of the factory installed ones. Might just be dirty, but the system has updated its configuration. But before we let it reboot itself, We'll just go into System Setup here, which if you're familiar with the old Compact Desk Pros of year, years past, this is pretty much the same thing. I really wonder how much it changed at all. But those are the pertinent details about this particular computer. Core 2 Duo 6400 at 2.13 GHz, so pretty decent for its time. System BIOS information. The rest of this stuff probably isn't terribly interesting. But one fun thing you can do with these systems, the Dells are not nearly as much fun in this regard because only some of them, and later model Optiplexes at that, let you tinker around with the system fan speed from within system setup and only then to turn it on at full speed. HP and Compaq, on the other hand, let you choose just what exact speed the fan should operate at. And some of them actually do this while they're live and running. The others make you wait until the system restarts. We'll see which kind this is. Oh, this is the fun one. I'm way too amused by this. Probably far more amused than I ought to be. Just in case you couldn't hear that. And that's not just the system processor fan. I believe it's also the one in the power supply as well. At least it used to be with some of these. We'll find out. Yep, both fans change speed when you adjust that setting within the BIOS setup utility. So now that I've had way too much fun with that, let's just go ahead and reboot this thing and see what it does. I'll probably find out that it's running Windows Vista or some similarly awful thing. And yes, that's what I said, and it's what I meant. All right, tried to boot over the network. Oh, looks like somebody cleared the hard drive on this one. Either that or it's not running. It's definitely spinning. So we don't really get to know what this thing's previous life was. Because at the very least, someone disabled the, uh, deleted, I mean, the startup files off of the hard drive. And they probably wiped the whole thing, which I certainly would have done because I don't have any great interest in that stuff. But it's always interesting from a historical standpoint, and strictly a historical standpoint, to know what a computer did in its day-to-day -day existence in its previous life, especially when it has some more unique options like this multi-port serial card that's in here. Speaking of, I might actually try to get that out of there so we can take a closer look at it and see if it's just a standard card or if it's some sort of special purpose Hewlett Packard upgrade part. I suspect it may be special purpose because you've, you've probably noticed this multi-wire harness sticking out of it that appears to go down to a point on the motherboard. It actually says Power Com Card or PWR Com Card, although there's a power connection back here. So I don't know how this works, but let's get it out and see if it gives up any secrets. Well, it took me a while to get it out of there, but when I did, it certainly yielded some very interesting things going on here. Take a look at this. 
Instead of what I would have expected to see, which would have been some sort of a PCI bus to RS-232 serial interface chip of some kind, like those made by Netmos Semiconductor, it looks like there's an entire low pin count I.O. controller on here, which is just an absolutely huge waste. And then, of course, less significantly, but certainly no less importantly, these small chips are very likely to be the actual line drivers for the serial interface that handle all the interactions with the outside world. And a rare sight on a PCI card. Jumpers aren't all that uncommon, but look at how many there are. And to look at this, it looks like you're allowed to set the voltage at which the serial port signals, which is certainly an interesting idea. I wonder if this was a bit more than just a standard issue serial, serial card. I noticed those dual voltage notations on the end of this card as well as on the system board, but I didn't really give any thought to it. It looks like in addition to being able to set the signaling voltage, it also looks like maybe I'm not sure. Maybe you could configure the addresses of each card, but with a full-fledged low-pin count I.O. controller on here, which typically handles all the low-speed I.O. that takes place on a motherboard, that is to say the card of classic ports, the parallel and serial port, as well as the floppy disk controller if there is one, and sometimes even the system's real-time clock, I don't know why they felt the need for a connection to the motherboard as well. Unless that's how it goes about getting something like an interrupt request line sent to it. You'll notice that it does actually plug in to the PCI bus. But that the edge card is very sparsely populated. Pinouts of the PCI slots are certainly available. And if I was feeling substantially dedicated to this, which I'm not, I could probably find out exactly which pins are connected, but I wouldn't be surprised if all they're doing is taking power and ground from the expansion slot. There's some of the information about the card, the part number. I'll certainly look that up, but if, again, if anyone's feeling industrious, they're more than welcome to do the same. And meanwhile, we'll go and look at the motherboard. You can see where that serial card is designed to plug in. It actually says COM card on the motherboard, and then right next to that are two connections for USB ports that aren't used on this particular system. They probably go with something like an optional build-to-order card reader. And here again, there are a whole slew of jumpers on this motherboard. It's not called out what they do. And then there's the motherboard's own low-pin count I.O. controller, which is, as soon as it'll focus, actually a differently numbered part. Not that I'm terribly surprised by that. Well, that's about all I've got to say for the HP. I don't know if I can get the Dell to live again. I might fiddle around with that real quick. But this video is getting very long-winded, so I think we're going to wrap things up soon. And the Dell's not really put, worth putting a whole lot of effort into. So I'll see if I can cajole it back to life here. But if I don't get it to do anything, then that's where the video is probably going to end. We'll see. So in a misguided effort to try and provoke this poor, worthless Dell thing into doing something interesting, I went ahead and removed the memory module and the video card, figuring that if there was any hope at all, that I would probably get some error beeps and hopefully some fault code LEDs on the back. So let's go ahead and turn it on and just see what happens here. Ooh, look at that. And we definitely do have something going on there. Uh, the LEDs A and B are amber, and C and D are green, which certainly should be the code for a missing memory module. Of course, it could also be complaining about the video card that I took out of it. Not sure whose video card this is, but I noted with a great deal of interest that it's got two VGA connectors on it. And this one is easily the longest that I've ever seen, and at first I was pondering why they would do something like that, but the answer is fairly obvious. They had to get back to the second set of solder pads for that connection past the artifacts for a DVI port that was never put on this card. So we'll put the memory back in first, and it will probably still complain bitterly about not having a video card, but if, if it's alive at all, that should be a multiple series of beeps with a pause in between as these Phoenix BIOS-based systems produce when they're unhappy about something. 
So let's just see what happens now that we've put that memory module back in. Heard a floppy drive seek. And I'm sure you heard that multiple set of beep codes. So now I'm on to something here. Let's just see if we can reseat this video card and expect it to work. Or if it's pooched and I'm going to have to go digging around in my collection of video cards to find something suitable. I don't really have a whole lot of selection in terms of AGP video cards. Well, I do, but they're nothing very good, although there's probably a couple of GeForce 4s in there, which would be an order of magnitude better than this is. I'm not even sure which one's probably the primary video port, but I'll bet it's the bottom one. So we'll just go ahead and try that out, and I guess we'll go whole hog here and round up some input devices and see if this thing's willing to actually do anything. Well, I could probably plug the hard drives back in. That probably wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. Of course, this implementation of an IDE cable is a little bit bass backwards. But they did it how it would fit. And speaking of fit, <laughs> it's quite a stretch to get this one drive connected to power. You've actually got to fold the case in a little bit. And then, this is another one of those jobs that's very difficult to do with a single hand. Because if you apply downward pressure on this, you're only going to cause the clamshell to open. So let's see what we get now. If the system does anything interesting, or maybe we get to find out that the video card, or perhaps even worse yet, the AGP slot is completely hosed. Nope. We got something. That's the display's sign-on. There's the Dell logo. Let's just see if it'll let me break into system setup. That is one of the reasons I do not like USB input devices because support under legacy environments that aren't USB aware, including a great many early BIOS setup utilities in systems that were the first to have USB, don't always recognize the input devices attached to them. I don't think there'll be anything interesting in the event log, but we'll take a look. <laughs> a lot, a whole slew of not only keyboard not functional, but also CMOS configuration errors. Look at all those. You hear that faint little click? It sounded like either there's a software keyboard click on this system, or maybe I'd filled up the keyboard buffer. Let's listen for that again. Yeah, I filled up the keyboard buffer. All right, so we'll go in here, and I don't know if this system is really new enough to do all the uh, needed IDE configuration itself, but we've definitely got some exceedingly interesting things going on here. We have an IDE slave, but no master, which is not, strictly speaking, a legal configuration, but a lot of systems will let you get away with doing that. So I have to figure that out until I do this thing probably won't boot. And we'll set the clock to something vaguely plausible. So that's the month. Get back here. That's the month. That's the day. And then we'll go forward about 28 years. <laughs> I'm surprised that went all the way back to 1990, to be honest. Okay, restore on AC power loss. Stay off. Alright, I'll just see if this thing will actually boot into some kind of an operating system. I'd be a little surprised if it did. But I've seen crazier things that people have done to computers to try and make them work again. And some of them have actually worked. Alright, so just hanging around with a blinking cursor. I can't tell if that drive's spinning or not. Well, let me play around with it a little bit more and see if I can get that drive to be recognized by some chance. I strongly suspect that somebody was goofing around with this thing in the misguided hopes of performing a miracle and making it work again. Because what we had going on here, whoever put that Western Digital drive in, 
they actually configured it with the jumper instead of using cable select as is the norm in these Dell systems and always has been they set it to a slave and then the Mac store drive was actually set to cable select still is set to cable select but it was plugged into the slave connection on the cable which is actually labeled as HD2 and zip so I went ahead and flipped the drives around and sure enough, that got me the result that I wanted. Both drives are now showing up the way that they're supposed to. And yes, I did change the Western Digital such that it was jumpered for cable select. So the, the IDE cable is actually the one that's doing all the configuration work right now. And it looks like we see two drives there. The system CMOS retention battery is so flat, <laughs> it, won't even, it won't even hold the uh, information like the date and time for a split second after it loses standby power. So go back in here and do this again, hush. It's not my fault that the keyboard wants to fall off the back of Naughty Truck's bed. Okay, we'll go down here and then we gotta go 28 odd years into the future. Boy, that's a sobering fact for those of us that were alive in 1990, as I certainly was about seven years old at the time but still okay there's our Dell logo and we'll see if this thing actually does manage to boot there we go Windows XP ta-da checking the file system on drive C didn't even ask me if I wanted to cancel the disk check just went and did it so rather than having you sit through all of that I'll be back in a moment, thanks to the magic of video editing. And there it is, folks, up and running at long last. It did indeed take a little while to boot, but how can you hardly blame it when it only has 256 megabytes of RAM with which to work? And for Windows XP, that's really not enough, even way back when this thing was new. It was a lot better than a lot of people got with either 64 or 128, but <laughs> still not exactly great. And that's about all there is to say about this one, so thank you as always for watching. I certainly do hope that you enjoyed the video, and as always, I am interested in hearing your constructive commentary if you happen to have some. <laughs>